two of the autocam cost section. So uh, uh, initially in the program, we had four speakers in uh, this session, but unfortunately Violeta Petrovic uh, had to uh, cancel uh, her talk. So we remain with three, but uh, well, I am sure that uh, we will have three uh, very interesting talks. The first presentation is of a Zdenek machine from uh, the Charles University of uh, uh, Prague. Uh, it's a long title, uh, but you will uh, say Zdenek, but it's about uh, our matrix. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's correct. It's a long title. I realized it's the longest title in this, in this conference, okay. unfortunately. So Zdenek, the floor is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be attending this meeting. Um, uh, it's a very nice meeting and uh, to have the opportunity to present the results of some of our latest developments. And I would like to thank the organizers for that. And uh, let me begin. Um, okay, so the um, topic of my presentation is localization of secret states in multi-electron molecular R matrix calculations. Um, so let me first uh, begin by a brief motivation for this work. Uh, so there is a, you know, an, an analogy that was proposed in, uh, in a paper of De Oliveira from 2010 between uh, photo um, excitation reactions and between reactions that are triggered by electron impact. So on the left, you can see an example of a reaction that can be triggered by a photon in a molecule. So the molecule is first excited to a bright pi pi state, pi pi star state, um, which induces some vibration dynamics in the molecule and that can cause uh, um, symmetry lowering that allows a coupling between this blue state and the green state, which is repulsive along some reaction coordinate. However, this um, repulsive state cross, uh, crosses the neutral um, state. So this allows uh, for the possibility uh, of uh, stabilization. Um, or of course, if the um, reaction proceeds along the green curve, the molecule can dissociate. Now, the idea is that something similar is happening actually in uh, electron collisions with molecules where the process of dissociated electron attachment can take place. So we can visualize, visualize it similarly. So first, uh, the electron is incoming with some energy and is trapped into a temporary negative ion, which is this pi star resonance. And this induces some vibration motion in the molecule and that can cause uh, symmetry lowering and a coupling of this resonance to another resonance state, which is this sigma star an ion state that is repulsive along some reaction coordinate and can cause dissociation of the molecule. So we have again here two possibilities. So either the molecule is broken by the, uh, the um, um, sigma star dissociative state or auto detachment can take place and the uh, electron is leaving before the molecule is broken. So in both these cases, uh, in the photo-induced reactions and electron-induced reactions, we have these simple molecular orbital picture uh, uh, sort of visualizations. So when electrons are either excited to or occupy some of these virtual orbitals. So in my talk, however, I will challenge the point of view um, on these electron-induced reactions somewhat. And I will ask whether our interpretation of these electron induced reactions that are pro uh, proceeding via this sigma star and ion are accurate. And you may ask, well, why are you asking such a silly question? I mean, we have known uh, this for a long time that this is how these reactions often proceed. Um, and I will show you that this is not so simple. Uh, so let's have a look at the, an example of dissociative electron attachment to formic acid. So when an electron is colliding with this molecule, um, dissociative electron attachment can take place and that can leave uh, behind a neutral hydrogen and a negatively charged fragment. Now, the question that we are asking is, what is this intermediate state that is mediating this reaction? Well, there are two theories were proposed to explain this. The first one, um, or theory one, as I call it here, was of Gordon Gallup and Ilya Fabrikan from 2009. And it says that this is simple. 
uh, as we just uh, saw on the previous slide. So the, elect the electron uh, is uh, attacking the molecule. It attaches to some sigma star repulsive state, which is repulsive along the bond that's being broken. Um, so that's simple. However, this resonance has some extreme properties, like it has a width of about six electron volts. So it's extremely short-lived. Well, there was a second theory uh, proposed to explain the same uh, process that was proposed by uh, Tom Resignon uh, actually a bit earlier in 2006. And it says, no, it's not so simple. Uh, actually, the electron is attaching to a narrow shape resonance, which we all know. Uh, is in this molecule, is present and is well known. But this uh, resonance is causing some distortion of the molecular geometry. So like there are some bonds that are being extended and uh, rotated, uh, in particular this CH bond uh, rotates. And this apparently opens the pathway for uh, the bond uh, to be broken. So this OH bond to be broken. So here we see this uh, potential energy uh, curve of the resonance, which crosses the neutral along this reaction coordinate. Well, but which one of those theories is correct? Well, we have to ask the experiment uh, to resolve this problem. And the experiments were, were done in a group of uh, Mikhail Alam in 2013. And the winner is that the direct OH bond break is actually taking place. So it's the simplest. Mechani mechanism. And well, how does the experiment uh, determine that? Well, you deuterate this uh, uh, um, uh, carbon position here, which prevents the out of plane motion that's necessary in the theory of Resignor to take place. So if you deuterate it, well, this uh, uh, out of plane motion is much uh, slower because deuterium is much heavier. And you see that indeed the experiment shows that if you uterate on this carbon position, the dissociative electron attachment cross section is virtually unchanged. So indeed, there is very little uh, distortion in the molecular geometry and the process is direct. However, there is a problem because this sigma star resonance that's been proposed has never been found by any up initial calculations. And this is not true, not only in formic acid, but also in other molecules like uracil, where the same mechanism is thought to take place. Well, so why is this such a problem? Why could we not find this uh, sigma star resonance? To understand this, we have to look at how we actually identify resonances in our computer data. So here's a couple of examples. Um, so here is a cross-section for electron impact, electronic excitation of pyrimidine uh, that we calculated, which is this black curve. And there is the experiment, which is this jagged red curve. And all these peaks here correspond to resonances. And we spend a lot of time trying to basically identify those resonances, make sure that these peaks really are resonances, that they are not some kind of other uh, you know, background scattering or anything like that. To do that, it's actually really difficult because you have to compute a lot of different data. You have to look at different observables like time delays, uh, you know, of course, eigenphase sums, you have to run models with different levels of complexity, etc. And sometimes you're still not sure. Um, so characterization of resonances is difficult when the resonances are very broad, such as in the case of uh, formic acid, or if the resonances have some mixed electronic character. Um, similar issues arise when you look at photoionization, which we did in CO2. And here are cross sections and uh, beta parameters for ionization into several lower slying states of uh, CO2. And well, some of these peaks that you see here are resonant, such as this really large broad peak in the cross-section for the C-channel. That's the well-known mixed uh, uh, core excited shape resonance. However, for example, this bump in the B-state cross-section, that's actually non-resonant. How, even though it looks like it could be resonance, it's actually an onset of B wave scattering. So we can put it in other terms and uh, we can realize that resonances are uh, in fact uh, solutions of the Schrodinger equation in the complex plane. So uh, there's some energy in the complex plane where the uh, resonance lives and the closer it is to the real axis, the uh, more prominent it is. 
So the pro however, if it's far away, we don't really see it clearly. So it's almost like looking at the uh, shadows on the wall, right? I mean, we look at the cross sections and we only can indirectly infer what's going on. So instead of uh, looking at the shadows, we would like to look at the real thing, which is something like this, where we have on the bottom, the actual complex energy plane and all the points there correspond to uh, resonance states, which are deep in the complex plane. And you see that indeed, if the point, the, the secret state is close to the real energy axis, then it leads to a prominent bump in the cross section, but not the other ones, which are far away. So I'm going to talk about how we actually obtain this kind of level of analysis, where we can look at uh, resonances in great detail and really analyze what's going on in the system. Um, so first of all, resonances, virtual states and bound states are special, uh, well, it's a, sort of one family of solutions of the Schrodinger equation, which are called the secret states, which are defined by the outgoing boundary conditions at infinity uh, with complex momentum. So these are solutions of the Schrodinger equation in for complex energies or complex momenta, which obey purely outgoing boundary conditions. Now there's a small complication, which is that these uh, virtual states and resonances are actually exponentially diverging solutions, which makes it uneasy to handle in uh, usual numerical methods. Um, so, but there are, um, you know, other methods that have been used uh, other than the R matrix to uh, calculate secret states. But in fact, one of the first, and yeah, I think one of the first uh, methods that were used in up initial calculations uh, to localize secret states were actually R matrix calculations already in 1988. And this was a work that was done by Leslie Morgan and Phil Burke on um, hydrogen fluoride and diatomic molecules. So those were pioneering calculations. However, uh, interestingly, this implementation has been lost and hasn't been used for, well, more than, well, over 20 years. There are other methods that could be used also to find secret states, such as uh, exterior complex scaling, uh, like was done, for example, for the giant resonance in Xenon in the work of Chen et al. So uh, how do we actually solve for the secret states in our matrix? Well, before we get to secret states, let's just uh, try to look at how the R matrix method actually works, which was, uh, I think, a question that a uh, few people raised uh, uh, before, so I shall attempt uh, a brief explanation. So let's say we have uh, the simplest problem, like scattering from uh, you know short range potential. So here is our solution, the continuum uh, wave function at some energy, which we'd like to obtain. How do we do that? Well, we realize that the whole uh, problem can be split into two parts. One part, which is the inner region, that's the difficult part where the potential is non-zero. Then the outer part, which is simple, that's where the potential is zero. So because it's a differential equation, because Schrodinger equation is a differential equation, we can solve it separately in different parts of space and then join it at the boundary, which is called the armatrix sphere. So the uh, simple solution is known explicitly, or at least its form is known explicitly. We know that in the outer region, it's some combination of the uh, vessel functions. Now, if we want to obtain the full solution, we have to match the inner solution with the outer solution on the armatrix sphere. And that's, a, that's done, as you know, uh, by just matching the amplitudes and its derivatives. Okay, so, so far, so good. However, the main feature of the armatrix method is that it embeds the derivative boundary condition right into the differential equation. So this is the, the key point of the armatrix. So how we do it is that we add this term, which is called the block term, and that basically calculates the derivative of the wave function at the boundary. So we insert into the uh, Schrodinger equation this term, which is the, say the derivative of the inner region wave function and uh, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, the derivative of the outer region wave function. By this, we ensure that the solution in the inner region automatically obeys the correct boundary conditions on the armatrix sphere. So we can now express the inner region solution using the uh, Green's function <clears throat> of the Schrodinger equation applied to the right-hand side or to the source term, which is here. <clears throat> the key point is that the uh, <clears throat> Green's function 
actually has an uh, exact or well, not exact, but um, an um, analytic dependence on energy. So this is a key point of the R matrix. While the states psi k are the so-called R matrix basis functions, which are obtained by diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in the inner region. So the last step that we have to make is to match the amplitudes of the solution from the inner region and the outer region. So we have now the expression for the inner region wave function in terms of the Green's function, and we just evaluate it at the boundary and set it equal to the outer region solution. So we get the fundamental equation of the R matrix. So this is the matching equation that stated in every R matrix talk. Um, so now that we have this, we can insert into this equation the known form of the outer region solution and express the unknown ver variable, which is the phase shift, basically, or the tangent of the phase shift. And we see that it's expressed in terms of the known outer region solutions and the so-called R matrix, which in this case is not an R matrix because it's a single channel problem, so it's only a function, but it's a function of energy that contains all the information about the inner region. Uh, so just to summarize, the R matrix is useful when the solution in the outer region part of space is known. The advantage of the R matrix uh, method is that the complicated inner region problem is solved only once. And uh, last but not least, the R matrix has an analytic dependence on energy. And this means that solutions for a large number of energies can be obtained very quickly and including in the complex energy plane. As you heard um, earlier this, uh, today, um, you know, the R matrix of course has a multi-electron version, which is what we use. And Jimena and Jakub have done a great job at explaining uh, what it does in detail for complicated targets. So just to reiterate, the inner region is defined by the extent of the charge density of the target molecule. It, uh, the inner region problem solves the complicated multi-electron problem using techniques that are similar to quantum chemistry, essentially by configuration interaction. Um, in the outer region, the uh, electron is far away from the molecule. So we can uh, imagine this process as just one particle, the electron feeling some effective potential representing the molecule. So it's a one electron problem for an electron moving in some non-spherical potential. And we solve the whole problem by matching uh, the inner um, and the outer region uh, by the R matrix condition. And again, uh, so in this case, if it's a multi-electron problem uh, and multi-channel problem, the R becomes really uh, a matrix, but it still has the same analytic dependence on energy, which is important to keep in mind. So uh, now how do we obtain the solutions in, of, for, the, for the secret states? So these are the solutions for the complex energies. Well, um, as I said, the, uh, well, as you know, you can see basically the whole uh, R matrix uh, problem or everything that depends on energy is confined to the outer region. So we are only interested in the outer region problem when we are looking at secret states. So the outer region problem is defined by this uh, set of coupled channel radial equations with some coupling potentials. As Jakub mentioned earlier, when there is a Coulomb interaction, then the, uh, that the dominates, so these terms can be safely neglected. Uh, similarly, if we have scattering from neutral molecules, then the dipolar interaction is the strongest and we can remove it by, well, we can remove the coupling that is used by, by diagonalization of, you know, the, the matrix of the um, uh, dipolar couplings and the angular momentum. Uh, so now we know how to deal with the outer region problem. So we can co compute the scattering states first. We just look at the scattering state. So in this problem, the scattering energy is fixed. And as in the uh, simple one dimensional problem, we are looking for the K matrix or the phase shifts uh, uh, that then completely describe the solution. So we just use the R matrix matching uh, weight, uh, equation and get an equation for the K matrix. Now, when we look for secret states, the task is reversed. We know what the boundary conditions are. These are defined by the outgoing, outgoing wave boundary conditions. That's, so there's no var variability here, but we look for energy a complex energy or complex momentum such that the solution exists, which means that the matching condition of the R matrix has a solution. So it leads to the problem of finding uh, 
solution to this matrix equation. So how do we do it in, 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 in practice? In practice, this is a root search problem. So we have some function m of e, which is a determinant of the R matrix uh, matching equation, and we look for its zeros. Um, so if we plot it in the complex plane, what it looks like when we plot the absolute value in the complex momentum plane, we see this. So the function has um, a huge gradient, as you can see. So from the real axis uh, to the complex uh, axis, it changes uh, magnitude by you know about 20 orders of magnitude easily. Uh, you know when when you move just a little bit away. So this means that any automatic search for poles, which are these dots here, would be very hard. So instead, what we do is we basically use more or less a brute force method. So we calculate this function, this m of e, on a very, very fine, dense grid of, uh, of momenta. And we just identify the poles as the local minima in this function. And uh, you know, make, uh, just I would like to reiterate that this is possible because the R matrix has an analytic dependence on energy. So that's why these calculations can be done uh, for so many energies as required. So now for some applications. Um, so <clears throat> I will describe uh, calculations for three molecules, um, which will then lead onto the um, problem that uh, I described at the beginning. So first we will look at how the resonances look like in the simplest system, which is nitrogen molecule. Well, in a simple system such as nitrogen molecule, which has only short range interaction and contains a well-known pi star resonance. Then we will move on to uh, collisions with HMCO, which uh, is interesting because in this system, we know that there actually is a dissociative sigma star resonance, but the system has a dipolar, uh, there is a dipole moment. And so there is a dipole interaction. Then we will move on to electron collisions with pyrrole, where the situation with resonance, with the sigma star resonance is unclear because we are not sure whether the resonance is there because previous calculations are in, inconclusive. So the situation in peril is very similar to formic acid, uracil, and other molecules. But this molecule has an advantage that it has a very high symmetry, but it also contains a dipolar interaction. So let's have a look at the uh, collisions with N2. So here I'm showing you several plots. So on the top left, you see uh, the uh, cross-sections uh, for uh, the scattering symmetry where the pi star resonance uh, appears. And the cross-sections are calculated as a function of the uh, uh, bond length. And in, on the bottom, you see the Seeger states as a function of the bond length in the complex energy plane. And the uh, um, horizontal axis is aligned with the cross-sections so that you see how the points correspond to what you see there. So this is basically these, as I was saying, these uh, shadows that we see. So in the cross sections, we see the peaks and that's a reflection of the pole in the complex energy plane. An equivalent picture is obtained when we look into the complex momentum plane. Uh, it's just that the trajectories look a bit different. So what we see here is that the resonance, which is here, actually does become a bound state as the, as the bond is extended. And the, that's clear both from the complex energy plane and from the cross sections. So the, the, the resonance becomes narrower uh, and the peak in the cross section is sharper and it becomes a bound state. Um, what we also note is that there is a large number of these very wide secret states. So this is a, this is a typical feature of, of every quantum scattering that was already shown in 1959. Uh, now let's have a look at the electron collisions with uh, uh, HNCO. So here we see that uh, we have, again, a resonance uh, here, which is a sigma star type of resonance. And, uh, but we see that in the complex energy plane, it behaves rather differently. It does not become narrower. It actually becomes broader. So you see that it, uh, as, as, the bond, as the bond length between uh, the hydrogen and the nitrogen is stretched, the resonance actually disappears in the continuum but it does not become a bound state. The bound state uh, appears actually uh, as a completely disconnected state. It's, it's disconnected from the trajectory of the resonance. And uh, we also find that the molecule supports this so-called dipole bound state, which is a very weakly uh, bound state by the dipole interaction. 
the fact that the resonance is disconnected from the valence bound state is a feature of the long range dipole interaction. And this was shown by uh, Estrada and Domke in 1984. Um, so on the right, you see the equivalent picture of what I was just describing. And that's from the work of Zabatsky from 2018. Uh, so you see the potential curve of the neutral, and here is the resonance, which goes down in energy, but becomes wide um, uh, as it's close, appears close to the threshold. And then there is the bound state here. So finally, let's have a look at the electron collisions with Pyrrhol. Pyrrhol uh, has, a, has a C2V symmetry. One more minute, please. Ah, okay. So there, is, uh, there, are, uh, there are four symmetries. And you can see that there are uh, quite a few uh, resonance states here. Um, so we see that there is a sigma star dissociative resonance. Uh, sorry, that's not dissociative. It's actually, it's a sigma star resonance that's high in energy. And then there are some narrow pi star resonances. What we are interested in is what happens when you uh, change the bond, when you extend the bond between the hydrogen and the nitrogen. What you see is that this resonance actually is not dissociative at all, and that the resonance is uh, disconnected uh, from the balance bound state. So there is no sigma star resonance that becomes bound in the system. So there is a problem now. So we have a, this valence bound state, which leads to the dissociative electron attachment, but there is no curve that connects it to the continuum. So where is the sigma star orbital gone? We can do it by analyzing the so-called Dyson, Dyson orbitals of the states that are involved. We can calculate what is the contribution of the sigma star orbital that we're looking for to the dipole bound state and the valence bound state. And we see that it's actually the dipole bound state which accumulates the contribution of the sigma star orbital and that is then transferred to the valence bound state. And we can also see how the sigma star orbital is reflected in the continuum. And we see that there is a sigma star orbital that contributes to the continuum, which looks like as if there was a resonance, but there is no resonance because we saw that in the calculations that there, are, there is no such resonance state. So in fact, this feature in the continuum is nothing else but a reflection of the dipole bound state that's present in the system. So our ap initial calculations are fine. It's only our interpretation of the process that was wrong. Uh, so there's uh, also a question of what happens when the molecule does not support bound states. And it basically uh, reduces to the fact that the uh, dipole bound state is replaced by a virtual state. So it's actually a, a rather simple mechanism. Uh, however, the message uh, of this talk is that when you look at, uh, when you compute uh, molecular orbitals, you have to be careful with their interpretation when you are trying to interpret uh, um, unbound states. So dissociative sigma star orbitals may not represent resonance states. What was done in the calculations of Gallup et al. was that it was used to parametrize in a Feshbach type a method, the uh, dissociative electron attachment, but please do not call this state a resonance. It's your choice of basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, uh, the main point is that the dissociative electron attachment in polar molecules does not require resonance formation, but it's induced instead by a dipole bound or virtual states. So with this, I, I finish and I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, uh, Jakub Benda, Thomas Nelze, Karl Hofek, and Jimena for work on the codes and uh, Uri Fedor uh, for suggestions uh, um, on, um, to look at Pearl. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zdenek, for this very clear talk. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, raise your virtual hands uh, from the Zoom application. Do we have any questions? Yes, Nicolas, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, yeah, I have a, a problem, uh, and I wonder if your method can uh, solve it. So. Let's say you have two resonances and they are uh, degenerate now. So they are really close. I mean, they, they have the same energy. So then they can, uh, I mean, it's hard to define the, the, their width because the, uh, you can have uh, like a free, uh, continuum, continuum coupling and so on. Do, do, can you treat that with your uh, method? Um, sure. Uh, well, 
I guess the, the, the question is what kind of degeneracy it is. If it's a degeneracy in, uh, in, if there are different symmetries, but they just appear at the same energy, or if it's some kind of accidental degeneracy where they appear really at the same energy. I don't well, know. the second one. Sorry? The second one. So same, uh, same symmetry, but just accidental. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can. They would. They would then appear. What you're saying is that you have basically a double pole or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Well, if it's a double pole, then then it's uh, then it's complicated. But I would like to point out that if the resonances are only degenerate in a, in in their real energy, but different in width, then of course we can we can see that clearly from from the complex plane, because of course in the complex plane they would appear at different points, uh, and they would be clearly separated. So actually, this method is something that can be used uh, to distinguish between overlapping resonances. But I see, uh, but the, the, the issue is that if, I mean, to get those width, uh, you need to be sure that we have this uh, continuum, continuum coupling correctly and so on. This would be done correctly in the R matrix part, and, and your analysis won't mess up with this uh, coupling. No, uh, no, 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 sure it won't. No, it's, it's all, no. this is up initial calculations. So it, it, would, it would be possible to calculate those, those resonances, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? I do not see any hands. What if not, just thank you, Zdenek, again thank you. for this nice talk. And uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Andras Chehi from the University of Debrecen. Please, Andras, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's good. And you can see. Let me share my. <laughs> okay, so can you see my slides? Yes, if you can do it full screen, please. Yes, okay, good. Okay, so. Thanks. Good. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity so that I can present uh, some of our recent results on uh, dynamic interference. Uh, in this talk, uh, I'd like to demonstrate how we can uh, trace strong field induced uh, 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 dynamics, rapid dynamics between uh, bound states of atomic systems uh, in the uh, photoelectron spectrum, especially in the dynamic interference pattern. Uh, it is uh, well known that uh, in strong laser fields, the atomic and molecular levels are subjected to uh, uh, stark shifts. And if the laser pulse uh, supports many optical cycles, then uh, the uh, uh, stark shifts follow the pulse intensity envelope. And uh, in this way, uh, the electrons emitted at the rising edge of the pulse have the same energies uh, uh, as those emitted on the falling edge of the pulse. And uh, due to this uh, time difference or phase shift uh, or phase difference, uh, these uh, electron amplitudes interfere and this uh, so-called uh, dynamic interference occurs. This uh, effect has been uh, well studied over the past decade uh, by several groups, just to mention a few of them. Uh, are listed here. And uh, importantly, mostly the direct or one photon ionization have been considered and uh, studied in uh, detail. And uh, it is also possible, uh, the dynamic interference also occurs when uh, resonance enhanced ionization uh, happens. And this, has, uh, this kind of process uh, has attracted uh, less interest over the years. So we really want to focus on uh, resonance enhanced ionization and following uh, dynamic interference to probe the dynamics of the system. A uh, few words about the uh, direct uh, dynamic interference. They are induced in short or high frequency uh, and high, high intensity laser passes in the XUV regime. And it was uh, observed that uh, beyond, uh, so uh, below a certain intensity, the single uh, photo peak we observe a single photo peak, but beyond a certain laser intensity, uh, this uh, single peak is replaced by a multi-peak pattern uh, in the spectrum. 
And uh, there are several milestones uh, of this uh, uh, kind of effect. Um, and uh, mostly in the beginning, model uh, ions have been studied and uh, later uh, atomic hydrogen, atomic helium. And uh, it was debated whether uh, this uh, dynamic interference occurs uh, for ground state systems or not. And later it was uh, clearly demonstrated that uh, ground state atoms also exhibit dynamic interference. And especially it was, uh, it was emphasized that uh, the appearance of dynamic interference can be considered as a, a signature of atomic uh, stabilization. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, resonance enhanced multiphoton ionization also leads to dynamic interference. And uh, uh, in such a process, one can probe the Rabi dynamics between the resonantly coupled atomic states by uh, 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 another photon, which leads to ionization. Uh, so the situation when uh, and the bound bound transition uh, is induced by a single photon, namely one plus one photon RMP process, have been studied before. And to show that in this case, the star shifts do not play a significant role. And um, so here we want to focus on situations when, uh, when the dynamics, uh, the, the star shift of the uh, energy levels uh, uh, plays an important role. So uh, we, want to, we want to study such a process like the two plus one photon Rempi process where the star shifts play a crucial role. And um, basically everything I'm talking about today here uh, can be found in this recently published paper. And uh, as I told uh, before, uh, we want to focus on the two plus one photon Rempi. Namely, we induce a two photon uh, uh, Rabi dynamics between two bound states of the atom, the lithium atom in this case, and probe these dynamics uh, uh, with a third photon that leads to ionization. So to do that, we develop a theory. We want to obtain a minimal uh, model, a minimal three state model to understand the uh, physics of uh, this process. So in our treatment, the total wave function of the system is uh, considered as shown here. Here we have the initial or the ground state, which is 2s for lithium. Uh, we have the resonance state, the, uh, which is the 4s state for lithium. And uh, we have the ionic states, which are labeled by epsilon. And these are populated after ionization. And we also have the so-called n-state manifold, which, which, uh, which are the non-essential states as they are not populated during the dynamics. They are far from resonance. Uh, that's why uh, these uh, states uh, rapidly oscillate. And these uh, include the bound state and also the continuum states as well. And uh, uh, so these are, even though they are not populated, they are important because as we will see, they give rise to the, to the uh, stark shifts of the uh, essential states, uh, the I, uh, the, the initial and the resonant states, uh, for example. So it, it is important to include these states in the uh, description. And of course we plug this uh, wave function form into the um, Schrodinger equation and we end up with this a uh, coupled set of uh, first order differential equations for the population amplitudes. And uh, here we have on the right side, the V is nothing but the, but the interac uh, interaction uh, uh, matrix element in the dipole uh, approximation. So mu is the transition dipole and epsilon, uh, uh, capital epsilon is the linearly polarized Gaussian path. Uh, this has such a form in our study, this uh, G is a Gaussian envelope and omega is a central frequency and gamma is uh, kept uh, constant uh, if not stated otherwise. So we have this set of uh, equations, which is, uh, well, it, it, it can be difficult to solve because there are many, many states uh, on the right side and uh, uh, the same number of coupled equations. So we want to simplify this set of equations uh, as much as possible, keeping the uh, essence of the problem. And uh, one can simplify this 
by uh, invoking that certain coupling, certain PDMs are zero, or they can be ne uh, neglected. So for example, the initial state is coupled to the M state. The M state manifold, the non-essential state constitu uh, uh, include the, the P states in this case, P states, because the, for example, the D states are not coupled to the S states. Uh, so due to the selection rules, uh, these are the P states. And um, so here, uh, for example, uh, uh, the coupling between the S states or the coupling between the P states is zero. So the ground state is coupled to the M state manifold fold only. And uh, the direct ionization is uh, neglected of the ground state because uh, the photon energy we consider here is well below the ionization potential. But we, we checked it uh, in multi-state calculations and indeed this is uh, uh, justified this kind of uh, uh, simplification. So there is no, uh, no significant, uh, no uh, notable uh, ionization from the ground state directly. And um, the R state, the, the forest state is coupled to the, to the non-essential state and also ionization can occur from this state, of course. And uh, here we have the M state manifold, which is coupled to the initial and resonance states. These states are coupled to, 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 the, to these two states. And we have the ionic states, which are populated from the resonance state. And uh, uh, this is a much more simple form of the equation, which can be further simplified by invoking certain uh, uh, approximations known from the literature. For example, the so-called local approximation. Uh, uh, in that approximation, we can substitute this term uh, by this uh, lossy term here, which is gamma is the, the rate for the ionization. Uh, so it describes the population loss of the R state or by invoking the rotating wave approximation, we can simplify this term here. We, here, omega one is the one photon Rabi frequency, uh, it is basically the coupling to the continuum. And uh, what we can do is uh, the adiabatic elimination of these M state manifold, because as I told before, these M states are rapidly oscillating. So one can uh, integrate this equation uh, by parts. And uh, uh, after that, we end up with this uh, form, which can be plugged back into the first two equations here and here. And after doing that, uh, the, uh, these uh, equations become uh, much more simple and we end up with a three state uh, equation. Uh, and uh, the following form is obtained. So here the three states and uh, in the matrix, we have the dynamic stark shifts this, uh, of, the, of the individual levels, uh, which are time dependent. And uh, we have the two photon Rabi frequency, the one photon Rabi frequency coupling to the continuum and also the detuning, the uh, delta is the two photon detuning kept zero in our study. And small delta is the one photon detuning in the continuum. And this UP is an important uh, quantity the ponderative shift of the continuum. But, uh, this has been debated in, uh, before whether it is important or not, we will show its impact. So these dark shifts uh, and also the, the two photon Rabi frequency are calculated from the uh, system uh, uh, proper, uh, stationary uh, quantities like the dipoles and the transition uh, and, uh, frequencies. And it depends also on the, laser on the laser frequency and follows the pulse intensity envelope. So we, uh, to do the dynamics, we need to calculate these, uh, these uh, or such kind of quantities in advance. Uh, the peak values has to be calculated from the system quantities. And uh, yes, we did that. And for a certain laser intensity for certain laser parameter set, I, I show you an example for the peak values of these quantities. And uh, we set our laser in two photon resonance with the transition. And uh, so with, with, with these uh, parameters, 
and of course varying the laser intensity, we can explore how the spectrum behaves. And uh, the spectrum can be calculated as the final the population of the ionic states as shown by this uh, simple formula. So what we get when uh, increasing the laser intensity is shown here. Uh, as we see, uh, more and more Rabi cycles are completed between the resonantly coupled uh, bound states. And meanwhile, uh, ionization uh, occurs. And uh, what we see in the spectra is that uh, this uh, dashed line here is the nominal position of the spectrum. So for, for weak passes, we, we see a single peak. And for increasing laser intensity, more and more uh, sub peaks appear in the spectrum. So the spectrum gets splitted and it's also shifted with respect to the nominal position. And uh, more, very importantly, this becomes uh, asymmetric. So all these features of the spectrum, uh, we are interested uh, in, the, uh, uh, reason, in the reason what is behind. So how do we can explain uh, these spectra features? And uh, for that, uh, we uh, wanted to develop a, uh, uh, an analytical model to explain uh, these kind of uh, uh, behaviors. And uh, the so-called uh, decoupled resonance approximation or decoupled resonance picture uh, we applied uh, which was found very uh, illustrative in previous works to, to explain such uh, kind of processes. Uh, it turns out that due to the strong coupling with the laser, laser uh, two resonances uh, emerge, and the energies of which can be obtained by diagonalizing this two by two uh, matrix shown here, because this uh, two by two matrix uh, describes the the resonant uh, transition between the initial and uh, uh, the two SM4 states in case of lithium. So by diagonalizing this, we obtain the energies of these uh, emerging resonances, which are present during the action of the laser pulse, and we obtain these energy expressions. So it's real uh, and imaginary part. And uh, here we have uh, the sum of the individual star shift, the sigma, and also the difference of the individual uh, uh, stark shifts included. And uh, as I told you before, the delta, the detuning is set zero here in our study. So, and, and this is the two photo Rabi frequency. So these energies follow the pulse intensity envelope also. And uh, one can calculate the wave functions and uh, it turns out uh, that they also, yeah, they, these, they are superpositions of the resonantly coupled state. Uh, these these uh, quantities here include the stark shifts and the and the all the strong field uh, quantities that we are interested in, and uh, it turns out that these expressions become very simple if if there are no stark shifts. So so if sigma is zero, then delta is uh, delta s is zero, so it it becomes very very simple, uh, and also here one over square root two. If, if there was no stark shift. And, and so it's, uh, it's, 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 it can be considered a general situation when, when, when there are stark shifts uh, uh, in the system. So uh, to proceed further, we can calculate, we can express the R state from these two, two, two uh, wave functions. We can express the R state. And from the R state, we can further express the continuum state. Uh, for the details, uh, um, you can see the cited reference shown here. Uh, but from the final, from the ionic state amplitude, we can then calculate the spectrum as before. So after doing this analytical derivation, uh, this uh, form is obtained for, for the spectrum. This looks uh, a bit, maybe a bit uh, ugly for first sight, but if we look closely, then it's uh, simple because it, uh, it is the uh, sum of two terms here in the braces, which describe the two resonances, resonance plus and resonance minus. And uh, yes, the, the, the interference pattern uh, in the spectrum emerges from these two terms, basically. So here, uh, here 
uh, we have, uh, of course, the one and two photographic frequencies, and uh, this is the imaginary integral, the imaginary part of the plasma state energies, integral of the uh, image, uh, real part of the energies, also here. And this small u is also an integral of the ponderative shift of the continuum levels. So this, uh, this is the so-called analytical model or the decoupled resonance picture model. Uh, I will refer to this uh, later. And uh, it is interesting to see how, how it compares to the, to the three state model results. And this is seen in this uh, figure here. So this red curve is the analytical result from the previous slide. And the open circle is the, is the three state model result. And we see that there is a fairly good qualitative agreement, at least all the main features of the spectrum are recovered from, by the analytical model, namely the uh, asymmetry of the spectrum, the shifting of the spectrum with respect to the nominal position, the number of sub peaks, the position of the sub peaks are all recovered by this model. So uh, one can use this in further uh, anal analysis. What is shown uh, here, uh, these, these intensities are chosen and the spectra is artificially shifted apart from each other for visualization. So these intensities are chosen such from the previously shown contour plot that the integer number of Rabi cycles are, are induced. So here one, two, three, four, and five Rabi cycles are induced and the number of sub peaks are the, uh, are the same numbers uh, in this uh, uh, spectra. What I'm showing here also uh, with, the, with the blue curve is the three state model results when the ponderative shift is excluded artificially. And we see that uh, there is a shifting of the spectrum. And uh, we see that the channel closing effect, uh, due to the channel closing effect, uh, we see this uh, shift. And there is not only a shift, but the, if we look closely, then the Interference pattern is uh, is modified uh, actually. So these ponderative shifts is indeed indeed important uh, to include, but uh, but maybe most important in the direct one photon ionization situations than here. So uh, we see all the features, all the important features here. What I want to highlight also is that uh, when we exclude the individual star shift from our model, what we get. And this, this is what we get. So when there are no star shift, then the spectrum is uh, always symmetric, always, uh, so the two sides are the same uh, height and also symmetric with respect to the, to the nominal position. So this is a clear uh, impact of the individual star shift that the, the spectrum is shifted and uh, the asymmetry occurs. So, yes, um, to further analyze and uh, uh, understand the, the origin of the, the spectra features, it is important, uh, it is uh, 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 good to look at the analytical uh, results. And uh, this we can see here. So here I'm showing you again, the energies of the resonances, uh, which, uh, which I showed you before. And uh, one can plot these energies, E plus and E minus. Uh, these energies follow the pulse intensity envelope because delta is zero, as I told you before. So the real parts of these energies uh, are shown here by the red and blue curves. Uh, in the uh, with, uh, relative to the to the uh, nominal position in the continuum, and there is also the ponderative shift subtracted because of the channel closing effect. So this is what we get. These are the energies of the emerging resonances, and this is the central line here, which is uh, from the uh, the same distance from the two uh, curves, from the red and the blue one. So this is the central line. So as we see, these two energies uh, uh, repel each other as the pulse 
is switched on. And when the pulses has a maximum, they are far farthest uh, apart from each other. And uh, this, uh, uh, and, and so the electrons emitted uh, during the action of the pulse are distributed in, in a wide energy window. And that's why that leads to the splitting of the spectrum, which is shown here by the green curve. And uh, we see that the center, center of the spectrum is shifted to higher energies because, because this center line is shifted to higher energies. And uh, the asymmetry of the spectrum is uh, 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 the result of uh, the fact that the blue curve is more shallow than the red one. And therefore, electrons emitted here are distributed in a narrow energy window. That's uh, why the, the lower energy side of the spectrum is higher, while uh, on the other side of the spectrum here, uh, the curvature is larger. So the electrons are uh, distributed in a wider energy window. So the higher energy side of the spectrum is uh, lower uh, in height. So uh, this is how one can um, uh, Imagine how one can uh, trace uh, uh, the this, uh, spectral features, uh, how one can uh, link the spectral features to the strong field quantities, such as the star shift and the two photon Rabi frequency. And uh, basically, uh, that is all I wanted to uh, talk about. And uh, with this, I'm uh, I arrived uh, at my summary and uh, outlook. So uh, we could show that the photoelectron spectra following uh, strong field transitions uh, are substantially modified uh, by dynamic stark shift and uh, also dynamic interference. And uh, the individual stark shifts are, uh, they cause the shifting of the spectrum and also the asymmetry while the multi-peak pattern is the result of uh, dynamic interference of electron amplitudes that are generated in the first and the second half of the uh, laser pass. We could also show that the ponderomotive shift of the continuum is important. It not only shifts the spectrum, but it also modifies the, the, the uh, uh, interference structure. And uh, these uh, presented models are useful and uh, um, important, but uh, uh, we, all, we are also working on a wave packet propagation uh, uh, approach to, to fully verify the, the uh, results shown here. Uh, but uh, it's a very challenging task because uh, we need a large spatial grids because, uh, because we want to keep the wave function, the outgoing wave packet uh, to, to get the spectrum. And uh, yeah, it's a challenging problem, but uh, hopefully we'll get it soon. And uh, yeah, we need long pulses because uh, to, 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 to be state selective during the excitation, we need uh, long pulses which have narrow bandwidths. And that's why we, we need a long uh, grid uh, several times uh, 10,000 uh, atomic units or so. And uh, what we also want to do in the future is uh, to do a quantitative analysis and uh, to extract uh, uh, star shifts and two photon uh, uh, Rabi uh, frequency values from the observed, observed spectrum. And uh, basically that's it. If you want, uh, later I can show you some preliminary wave packet propagation results, which we do, did uh, for a simple system. So this verifies uh, the, the validity of the model. But this is not for the lithium, but for a simple system. So finally, I have to acknowledge my colleagues with whom this research has been done. Attila taught from Eli Arps was involved and also my, my master student who uh, did some wave packet propagation uh, for a simple system. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andras, for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, raise your virtual hands. 
I do not see any hand yet. So Andras, I understood that uh, you made these calculations for lithium. Did you try or uh, could you try for molecules, similar calculations, or it is uh, too complicated? Well, uh, we have not yet done such calculations for molecules, but uh, in the literature, there is some, there are some results for molecules. Uh, what we are especially interested in now for molecules is uh, whether we can see such kind of effect uh, for the nuclear wave packet, maybe. So to induce the Rabi transition or, or the, uh, the, in the dissociation uh, of the photofragments. Okay, thank you very much. I still do not see any uh, hands or questions. So thank you again for your uh, talk. Thank and you. Uh, let's move to uh, our last uh, uh, speaker. Our last speaker is Torsha Moitra. Uh, Torsha, are you here? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Andras, if you could, if you can uh, uh, finish your... Uh, uh, yes, uh, I am. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, Tosha, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, you are from um, uh, Technical University of Denmark, and the floor is yours for your talk, please. Thank you. If you can share your screen, yes. Uh, can you see my screen properly yes, now? It is, it is very good. It is very um, does this uh, sidebar with everybody's picture appear? Oh, it is it is good. It, okay. it's not full screen. It's uh, good. You can you can start your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Torsha Moitro. I'm a PhD student in the group of Professor Sonia Koriani at the Department of Chemistry, Technical University of Denmark. Today, I will be talking on the theoretical modeling of photoionization observables. But before I start, I would like to thank Professor Nagy and all the organizers of the Working Group 2 meeting of the Cost Action Atochem for giving me the opportunity to present my work before you all. Throughout this three-day meeting, we have heard a lot about ionization processes. So I won't um, go a lot deep into the introduction of it. Just as a one-liner, I would like to say that photoelectron spectroscopy is the process in which an electron is ejected from the system upon shining light on it. This outgoing electron has a kinetic energy which is equal uh, to the difference in energy of the incident photon and the bound state ionization energy of the system. What we want is to describe this process theoretically. And for that, we must mathematically model all the individual components involved in the process, which is the incident photon, the bound state of the system, which is both the initial n electron state and the final n minus one electron state, and also, the outgoing electron. The major obstacle in describing or uh, theoretically computing the uh, photo electron obs photoelectron observables is uh, the need to incorporate correlation effects. We have broadly classified this into two categories. The first is the treatment of the correlation between the bound state. Actually, this is the doable part, more easily doable part. We can incorporate the correlation between um, the initial n and the final n minus one bound state of the system by um, using um, highly correlated wave function based methods like CI, couple cluster hierarchy of methods, the ADC family of methods. So the next is the more involved one, which is broadly termed as interchannel coupling. This can be further subdivided into two categories. The first is the interaction between the individual continuum channels. This is termed as pure open channel states. The next is the interaction 
between the electronic continuum and the discrete bound excitations, which is termed as the closed channel states. Even though here I have um, specifically categorized them, distinguished them, but the boundaries between these correlation effects are quite blurred. And throughout my presentation, I will be uh, going, getting back to the importance of the incorporation of correlation effects in the treatment of both the bound and the continuum states uh, multiple times. The key theoretical quantity that is required to be computed to get photoelectron observables are, is known as the photoelectron transition matrix element, DIF. It is basically the overlap of the initial N electron system with the final composite system comprising of the N minus one bound state of the system and the outgoing electron coupled by the dipole operator. Two slides before I had shown the essential components of for describing the process. And here, this simple expression has them all chi i n and the n minus one electron bound state is the description of the bound state the the description of the outgoing electron is a part of pi f and uh, the incident photon is described by the electric dipole operator mu in principle um, we can uh, expand the final composite wave function phi f in terms of the configuration interaction approach of the final state. This has two terms. The first term is the antisymmetrized product of all n minus one bound electron states accessible at energy E coupled to the continuum wave function phi Eij alpha. The second term is a linear combination of all localized n electron bases with coefficients c, e, k, i. This second term takes care of autoionizing states. But this full close coupling uh, expression is computationally very, very expensive. Hence, we restrict ourselves to only the first term and even within the first term, we only consider only one product. Um, so this is known as the single channel approximation in which um, the final state of the uh, final wave function is described by the antisymmetrized product of the N minus one bound state and the continuum wave function. This simple approximation comes with its own drawback. This approach lacks coupling between the open channels and it also lacks correlation between the bound and the continuum channels. So within this single channel approximation, the many particle photoelectron matrix element boils down to the single particle photoelectron matrix element DIF, where phi DIF and the eta DIF is known as the Dyson and the conjugate Dyson orbital. The phi DIF and eta DIF has within it compressed all the information of the bound part of the system. Considering the photoelectron wave function to be orthogonal to all the bound orbitals included in the initial state expansion, the conjugate Dyson term vanishes. And then our photoelectron matrix elements acquires a very simple notation, which is basically just the overlap of the Dyson orbital and the continuum wave function connected by the electric dipole operator. Here, gamma is the component, is the Cartesian component. This photoelectron matrix element is used to compute the, dif uh, the differential cross section d sigma dk. And this is a quite a standard equation where alpha is the fine structure constant and omega is the photon energy. 
upon a lot of mathematical manipulations we arrive at this expression this expression shows that the angular distribution of the photoelectron can be described by only three parameters namely sigma which is the partial photoionization cross section beta which is the asymmetry parameter and d the photoelectron dichroic parameter here i must state that this d should not be confused with the photoelectron transition matrix element dif in this expression the theta is the scattering term and p1 and p2 are the legendre polynomials and mr describes the polarization of the incident light mr is equal to 0 for linearly polarized light and mr is equal to plus or minus 1 for left and circu right circularly polarized light respectively with that said now i will move on to the description of the bound state we i have shown you that we want to focus on the dyson orbitals the one electron dyson orbitals are basically defined as the overlap of the initial n electron state of the system with the final n minus 1 electron state of the system this reduces to a linear combination of ground state molecular spin orbitals phi p with coefficients gamma p now consider a situation where the ionization is solely occurring from the jth molecular orbital under this situation the dyson orbital is exactly equal to the jth molecular orbital and the contribution of the jth molecular orbital towards the dyson orbital is 1 and all other molecular orbitals have a contribution of 0 under this situation the ionization energy of the system is equal to the negative of the jth molecular orbital energy this is also what is stated by the kupmans theorem we will use this kupmans theorem to treat the bound state using hartree-fock molecular orbitals and dft molecular orbitals but for the dyson orbitals we use the equation of motion couple cluster singles and doubles formalism within this framework the uh, bound states of the system are obtained by diagonalizing the non-hermitian similarity transformed hamiltonian in this framework the right and the left eigen vectors of h bar are not identical they are distinct and for this situation the transition strength sif is given by this expression this shows us that the dif is not equal to the complex conjugate of dfi following that the left dyson orbital is not equal to the complex conjugate of the right dyson orbitals however both of these two can be expressed as a linear combination of ground state molecular spin orbitals what varies is the coefficients uh, the left and the right dyson orbital coefficients are distinct and the dyson coefficients for the ionization from the ground state are given by this expression here t r and l dagger are excitation operators and for rip or lip these operators are not electron number conserving we have also looked into ionization from excited states but i won't show any results for that today because we did not have results the experimental results to compare with now i move on to the description of the continuum orbitals and this is the tricky part the description of the continuum orbitals um requires a suitable basis function which will be capable of um incorporating its distinct boundary conditions as well as the continuum orbitals are infinitely oscillating functions and the simplest approach is to use plane wave or coulomb wave formalisms i must also mention here that the uh, generally used uh, gaussian type or slater type orbitals are deemed um, unfit for this purpose 
the plane wave uh, considers that after the ionization has occurred, the charged ion core it has a charge of zero. This is ideally the case for photodetachment processes. And the Coulomb wave formalism considers that the ionized core has a positive one charge. However, actually the ionized core has a charge something it's in between these two extreme values. For describing the continuum for a um, larger molecule, we need a more flexible basis function, which is which will be capable of multicentric linear combination of atomic orbitals. In these three days of the meeting, we have already heard a lot about B spline functions, and we also use um, the flexibility uh, given by B spline functions to describe the continuum orbitals. The primitive B spline functions are described by chi JLM, which is a product of the radial part 1 by r BJR and the angular part y lm theta phi. What we do is we place a long range, large angular momentum expansion at the origin. Say for the uh, water molecule, we place it at the oxygen atom. This takes care of the asymptotic behavior of the uh, continuum orbitals. And we place additional short range expansions at each of the nuclear positions to take care of Coulomb cusps. Even though here I show the expansion for only one hydrogen atom, an equivalent one is present also on the other hydrogen atom. After that, we solve for the continuum orbitals by solving the Schrodinger equation in the angular momentum representation, where the constant Hamiltonian is given by this expression. For our purpose, we use the LB94 exchange correlation potential and this choice has been guided by the fact that this is quite widely used in the literature. The tools that we use include uh, the QCAM software from which we obtain the equation of motion couple cluster Dyson orbitals, and we have used throughout the augmented CCPVTZ basis set. All computations using the LCAO B spline DFT continuum orbitals and later on for the TGDFT continuum orbitals are um, implemented in the Tiresia code developed by Professor Piero de Cleva, who is also a part of today's audience. And um, the nice part of it is that this Tiresia code will be soon open source. For all plane wave and Coulomb wave descriptions of the continuum, we use the EZ Dyson code. First of all, we tested the accuracy of these individual approaches for describing the bound and the continuum part. For that, we chose uh, to study the three lowest energy ionizations of CO molecule. First of all, we keep the description of the continuum part constant to be spline DFT and vary the description of the bound state from Hartree-Fock to DFT to CC Dyson which are shown by the blue, orange, and green lines. We see that these are almost overlapping with one another. And this is actually quite expected as the Dyson orbitals are quite identical to the molecular orbitals considered by Koopman's theorem. And also the Dyson norm for these um, ionizations is greater than 0.9. Next, uh, we shift our focus on the performance of the continuum part uh, for the B-spline DFT, plane wave and Coulomb wave approaches. Um, again, keeping the bound state description uh, constant to CC Dyson. This can be shown by the green, maroon and violet lines. What we see is that B-spline DFT certainly outperforms the other two approaches and is usually within the experimental error bars. The simpler analytic approaches can somewhat describe the tail region, the behavior of the tail region with large vertical deviations, but it completely fails uh, near the ionization threshold. And this ionization threshold is basically the fingerprint region and is essential. From now onwards, I won't show any further results for plane wave and Coulomb wave description of the continuum. 
Next, we looked into the photoelectron dichroic parameter of S methyl oxygen, which is a prototypical molecule for studying uh, this parameter. We looked into the uh, six outermost or the six lowest energy ionizations for this molecule. And here we see the importance of the inclusion of correlation in the treatment of the bound state of the system. The Koopman's theorem based Hartree-Fock molecular orbital uh, shown by the blue lines are uh, quite deviated from experiments or are of completely opposite sign. DFT performs better, but sometimes like in the case of the ionization from the 11th molecular orbital, it um, shows larger deviation, whereas couple cluster Dyson orbitals are almost always within the experimental error bars. Then we looked into a notoriously difficult case, which is the Cooper minimum of argon. It is a signature of the change in the sign of the matrix element depicting the transition into one of the principal continuum channels. It arises due to ionization from the 3p orbital. As the uh, partial photoionization cross section for ionization from the 3p is much larger than that of 3s, the total cross section is almost similar to the partial photoionization cross section for argon 3p. It has been shown earlier that plane wave and Coulomb wave approaches cannot capture this sophisticated experimental phenomenon observation. B spline DFT shown by the bold green lines does capture this process, but the minima is shifted by approximately 15 electron volts towards the lower photon energy region. Due to electron electron interactions and um, coupling between the argon 3p and the 3s channels, a Cooper minima is also experimentally observed in the partial photoionization cross section of argon 3s, which are shown here by the green dots. But B spline DFT approach lacks correlation in its treatment of the continuum. So we don't capture this process. Somehow we have to include in our treatment interchannel coupling effects to capture the Cooper minima in the argon 3S photoionization cross-section. The simplest approach uh, of including interchannel coupling effects while still being uh, within the uh, single determinant form for the bound state is the singly excited configuration interaction, CIS, or the tam dankoff approximation, TDA. Linear additional correlation uh, may be included via RPA in the linear response framework. This still conserves the essential CIS structure of the excitation. Similarly, the equivalent formulation for DFT is the TDDFT approach, which we use. Here, delta rho is the first order change in the electron density induced by the potential and uh, chi is the electric susceptibility, and delta V is the first order change in the potential induced by the change in the electron density. And K is the linear kernel connecting the two. In this situation, the full potential is given as the sum of the external perturbing potential mu and the response potential delta V. Now, within our Dyson TDDFT approach, the photoelectron matrix element looks quite similar to that of the Dyson DFT approach, the only difference being that the mu term is now replaced by the full VSCF potential. Thus, the DIF term is the overlap of the Dyson orbital with the continuum wave function connected by the VSCF term. This has been implemented in the Tiresia code and uh, the results that I will show afterwards are yet to be published. So first thing we did was we revisited the Cooper minima of argon. This is shown by the maroon lines, um, which uses couple cluster Dysons for describing the bound path and B spline TDDFT for the continuum description. We see that the uh, shift that was observed for B spline DFT by the green lines here uh, is now removed. Also, we are able to capture the minima 
in the partial photoionization cross section of the argon 3s again uh, we um, tested the performance of the dyson tdtft approach and for this purpose we used uh, we chose the h2s molecule and we looked into the two lowest energy ionization pathways of h2s here the dyson orbitals are shown as the insets and we see that the major contribution comes from the 3p orbital of sulfur and thus we expect to see and experimentally it is also seen that there occurs a cooper minimum again uh, changing the description of the bound state does not make any difference because the dyson orbital is quite similar to the corresponding molecular orbital uh, taken considered uh, by kupmann's theorem but um, on moving from the b spline dft to the tdtft approach we now locate the cooper minima at the right position following that we looked into the five outermost ionization uh, from cs2 molecule the four outermost ones are quite straightforward and i does don't present the results here these are basically ionizations with uh, dyson orbitals being identical to the corresponding molecular orbitals and the uh, dyson norms are greater than 0.9 the interesting one is the fifth one the d band which has an experimental ionization energy of 17.2 by kupmann's theorem this should be due to ionization from the four sigma u orbital but the ionization energy corresponding to ionization from the four sigma u orbital is much much higher in energy incorporating correlation um, via the umccsd dyson orbitals we obtain it at um, at 17.78 electron volts what we see is that the dyson norm is quite low this has been identified as a satellite state of pi u character two more minutes please with that said i would like to summarize my uh, our work our findings first of all the major finding is that uh, b spline dft approach outperforms simpler plane wave and coulomb wave approaches a general recommendation would be to use for the bound state description eom couple cluster dyson orbitals and for the continuum b spline dft approach however if we are interested in investigating more sophisticated experimental phenomena we must use the tddft approach now i would like to thank my phd supervisor professor sonia koriani and i would especially like to thank professor piero decleva who has been very key in this whole project the others who have been involved in this project is professor henrik koch and dr aurora ponzi finally i would like to thank all our group members especially rasmus and mata who had helped me uh, immensely during the initial days of the project i would like to thank the funding agencies marie curie european training network cosine and atokem for giving me the opportunity to present my work and lastly i would like to thank you all for your kind attention thank you very much for this uh, very logical presentation and uh, very nice uh, results uh, uh, please uh, if you have questions raise your hands your virtual hands i do not see yet any yes alexander please Okay, it's probably not a question, just just a comment because uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of times that uh, the Dyson orbital is not very much different from the one particle orbitals that you get. This is mm -hmm. of only correct when you don't have uh, correlation effects or when the correlation effects are not strong. Yes. As Koopman's theorem is something very very low level approximation uh -huh. which is already. For mm. decades that it's uh, mm. the case, so uh, uh, one has to be careful when compare uh, Dyson orbitals with, uh, let's say, simple molecular orbitals or Hartree-Fock or whatever, uh, Conchem, especially mm. orbitals, because these are different constructs. And of course, you can have similarities only in the cases when you don't uh, have uh, strong uh, correlation effects. 
So for example, for the satellite state that you are talking about, I'm sure that the, the orbitals look extremely different. Yes, they do. So, <laughs> yeah. That yeah, was... also we have looked into some uh, more uh, complex molecules, uh, like a transition metal complex, where they are very, very different. Um, yeah, so, sure. yeah, but the, the, these are the simpler examples that I am showing, uh, where the correlation is not playing a dominant role for the bound state. Exactly, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Fernando? Uh, very nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. I am curious to know uh, uh, how much, uh, how, how expensive is Dyson TDDFT compared to Dyson DFT? Is it orders of magnitude more expensive or is it just a little bit more expensive? Uh, for doing the Dyson TDDFT, we start with the Dyson DFT. Um, and then um, we the most expensive step is to get the uh, electric susceptibility, which is a uh, uh, dependent on the energy. Um, so it is, uh, it builds on the Dyson DFT approach. So, uh, and we do get, uh, when we are computing the Dyson DDDFT uh, orbitals, we do get as a byproduct the Dyson DFT results as well. Um, but I can't really comment on the exact order to which they are more expensive. Okay, but from what you say, it doesn't seem that it's going to be 10 times more expensive. No, it's no, just, no, it is no, not. It's just a bit more expensive. So it's, yes. really, it's really worth trying mm. the DFT yeah. instead of DFT in combination with Dyson. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers from this session for their nice uh, presentations. And uh, now we will have uh, 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 some short uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, but after the closing remarks, you will have uh, the meet the speaker sessions as usual. So after we finish uh, here on this uh, Zoom session, we will have uh, the meet the speaker. OK, uh, well, uh, for uh, some closing words, I would like to uh, share my uh, screen. I have a very short uh, presentation. I think this is the one. Okay, so uh, first I would like to thank uh, all the speakers of uh, uh, this meeting and uh, chairs for their uh, uh, very important contribution for the success of uh, 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 this meeting. I am very sorry that you could not come uh, to our university, the Babesh Boy University, but I have put here the uh, building to uh, see it, how, it look, how it looks. If you come to Cluj, that just recognize that this is our workplace. Okay, so uh, for the beginning, uh, some statistics. Uh, in this um, session, we had, uh, in this meeting, we had uh, initially 66 registered participants, but uh, in uh, the last minute, uh, four other people uh, um, asked to join. So practically, we had 70 participants on this uh, uh, Zoom uh, uh, platform. Uh, these 70 participants were from uh, 16 countries, as you see here, and you can observe that uh, uh, Spain is uh, the champion. So from Spain, we have uh, 15 participants from uh, other countries, less than 10, but uh, uh, 16 countries, uh, all European uh, countries, of course, uh, cost is uh, mainly European uh, uh, network. Uh, we had uh, uh, 21 uh, uh, talks uh, from uh, 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 people in different positions, from PhD students to full professors. Uh, I, uh, in my opinion, uh, all uh, the presentations uh, were of very high uh, scientific standards and uh, uh, very interesting. 
uh, as you have may observe, uh, this was a self-organized meeting. So uh, practically the program uh, was set up by you because uh, the people from the working group too who uh, volunteered to uh, uh, give a talk, they have uh, had this uh, presentation. So uh, it was not I or somebody else who set up uh, the program. It was you, practically. We have uh, self-organized this uh, uh, meeting, and I think that it uh, worked very good, very interesting topics. Uh, in a Zoom session, uh, typically we had uh, around uh, 55, uh, 57 participants. Uh, uh, not all simultaneously, you have may observed we had around uh, 45, uh, 50 people simultaneously. Uh, this was valid for the first two days. Uh, today, uh, maybe a little bit less uh, uh, participants uh, were. Uh, as you know, uh, our uh, meeting was um, streamed also on a YouTube channel. Uh, here you have the statistics uh, in the first session, uh, uh, 36 people were uh, following this uh, YouTube transmission, uh, second uh, uh, session 29. After that, uh, less people, I do not have the statistics for today, but probably people have realized that they can watch these uh, YouTube uh, uh, movies later. Uh, the first session, for instance, was already watched by 228 people. So uh, uh, 36 uh, followed live, but uh, uh, these presentations uh, uh, could be followed later. And uh, uh, you should know that uh, uh, after this meeting, probably next week, we will move uh, all the registered uh, uh, presentations to the AutoCAM YouTube channel and they will remain there and uh, you can uh, watch your colleagues uh, or yourself uh, also next year uh, there. So uh, uh, these interesting talks uh, will remain on the AutoCAM YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the people who had uh, in uh, organizing this uh, meeting. First, uh, the team from the Babesville University. Uh, most of the uh, technical uh, uh, work was done by uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Ferenc Yara Isabu. So uh, without him, we could not uh, uh, solve all these uh, technical issues. Uh, uh, Katalin Nagy uh, uh, had uh, uh, edited the uh, abstract book, which is uh, on our web page. Uh, and uh, Shandor Boybe and Istvan Tot also helped a lot in uh, this uh, organization. And of course, from the Atocam uh, Action Management, uh, I would like to thank Fernando Martin for his advices, uh, uh, to Beatriz for the administrative uh, uh, work, and uh, to Aurora Ponzi, the science communication manager for uh, uh, advertising this uh, uh, meeting on different channels. Uh, finally, I have put uh, here on this page a lot of uh, uh, question marks. Uh, maybe we should think when uh, we would uh, do the next uh, meeting of the working group uh, uh, two. Uh, I don't know if it can be done face-to-face -face or virtual. Uh, I am very optimistic that uh, uh, till October uh, uh, this uh, year, most of the people from Europe will be vaccinated and uh, maybe in uh, the fall of this year, we can do also a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. Let's see how these uh, uh, pandemics uh, ev uh, evaluates and uh, uh, how many people will be vaccinated. I have to sell, tell you that I am already vaccinated, so I just uh, wait for the other people to be uh, vaccinated from Europe. Uh, so
So uh, we we should uh, do a next meeting uh, maybe in fall of 2021 or uh, in spring of 2022. Let's see if it is virtual or not. Uh, what uh, is uh, uh, my request to all of you? Uh, think about uh, who could volunteer for the organization. So I am expecting proposals for the uh, organization, uh, either online or face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, uh, meeting. About the uh, topics of uh, our uh, research in this uh, working group too, uh, I have to uh, say again that uh, we have seen at this uh, uh, working group two meeting that uh, uh, people are doing research of very high uh, uh, scientific uh, standards. But uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, many of us uh, did not uh, listen to uh, Fernando, who have said that the uh, beginning of uh, this uh, cost action that uh, uh, we should uh, study and make calculations for large molecules. Here we had some uh, presentations for uh, about calculations of large molecules, but uh, as you have seen, uh, uh, we had very uh, uh, many many results about. Uh, interaction of atoms or diatomic molecules with these uh, 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 laser pulses. Uh, of course, of very high uh, scientific standard and uh, 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 interesting. But uh, as Fernando have said that uh, we should uh, uh, study large molecules, uh, maybe we could listen to him and maybe Fernando will have some uh, uh, comment on uh, uh, this. So uh, what are the topics we should uh, study in this uh, uh, working group? Well, uh, uh, finally, I uh, would like to thank uh, for your participation and uh, I would uh, uh, give the floor to Fernando for some uh, uh, closing uh, words. Please, Fernando. Thank you, Ladislao, for 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 your presentation. So first, I I really want to thank very very much uh, Ladislao, Sander, Ferenc, Katalin, and Itzvan for the very hard work they have done. To organize this meeting, uh, the organization has been perfect, I have to say. Uh, and I realized that these things can be done even without the help of a company. So congratulations for the perfect uh, scientific and technical organization. Um, that's, I think, the most important thing uh, for me to say. Uh, well, apart from that, just to remind you that, uh, well, ATOCHEM uh, is, uh, is a network in which we aim at uh, exploring how to use uh, ATOSECON sources to uh, study problems of chemical relevance. Uh, so an atom is still chemistry, very simple chemistry, but I would say that atoms are welcome, very welcome, especially because they are ideal benchmarks to treat new methodologies and to, the, and to find new concepts. But uh, uh, Ladislao is right. I think that during this action, we should make an effort, the collective effort to uh, move to progressively more complex systems so that uh, we can at some point uh, address problems that are closer to, to chemistry. Uh, and to conclude, I just uh, want to remind you a few uh, tools that are available in our action. Uh, to benefit from these tools, I insist once again that uh, it's very important to register in the uh, in the Ato uh, Chem website. So I will I will show you very briefly uh, this website. Um, so this is the Ato Chem website. And here you can find all the information about uh, working groups, 
Um, here you have details and you have here, you know, a place where you can register very easily. You click here and in two minutes you are done. And I insist it is very important that uh, your group is registered. And also uh, we make a special place for young researchers to, uh, re uh, to register individually. So I encourage you to uh, register because in this way you will receive uh, news from us about all the different activities. And among these activities, um, I'd like to uh, remind you that uh, there are already two schools that are going to take place very soon. One is uh, a winter school on atosecond technologies that will take place from 8 uh, to 11 March. This is uh, mainly uh, experimental but uh, we are theoreticians and we should be aware of the latest experimental development. So if you are interested in registering, you are still in time to do it. The deadline uh, to register to that school is today at midnight. So you still have a few hours to do it if you are interested. There is another school that will uh, take place uh, from 22 to 26 March. Uh, about new computational methods for atosecond molecular processes. Unfortunately, the registration for this school is already closed because there was an avalanche of uh, applications. And in fact, we will not be able to accept everybody to this school, but uh, we, our idea is to repeat this school every year. So uh, if you are interested in this school and you cannot attend this year, you can do it next year and so, keep uh, tuned to our website where you can find, as you see here, the news about the different events. I'd like to also to re remind you two important things. Uh, one is uh, um, that we will have a special issue in computer physics communication. You, you, you heard about that in uh, Jimena uh, talk this morning. So if you are developing uh, software uh, that is uh, relevant for the topics in this cost action, you are welcome to submit a paper. And, uh, and knowing that uh, it is not only a paper, what you have to submit, but you also have to submit software. And, uh, and the deadline for this uh, will be um, the fall of 2022. I want to encourage you to, um, to apply for uh, grants that are called Inclusive Target Country Conference Grants. These are grants that cover um, uh, fees and travel expenses uh, to attend conferences. Uh, nowadays, traveling is not possible, but there are many conferences that still uh, require to pay a fee, even if they are organized online. And uh, so if you belong to one of these uh, inclusive target countries and you have the list here in the, in the, in the cost uh, in the ATOCAM website, you can apply for that and we have funding to support uh, uh, your attendance. And also uh, I want to encourage you very much um, if things uh, go on improving in Europe as it seems to be the case, uh, I encourage you very, very much to apply for short-term scientific missions, uh, which are devoted mainly for collaborations between different nodes of the uh, ATOCAM network, in which uh, a researcher applies for some funding and can spend from one week up to two months in, uh, uh, in one of the ATOCAM nodes to develop a scientific project in collaboration with another group. So this is ideal for PhD students, but of course, it's also a good thing for more senior researchers who want to spend a short period of time somewhere else to develop new ideas with other collaborators. And with this, I think I, I, I finish. I conclude by reiterating my, my deep thanks to, um, to Ladislao, Naji, and his team for organizing this. And I hope to see you all in future ATOCAM events. Thank you very much and, uh, and goodbye. Thank you, Fernando. So uh, but please uh, uh, do not uh, forget about the uh, meet the speaker opportunity. So uh, you can uh, go and uh, 
talk with the speakers. So uh, have a nice weekend and goodbye. Bye. Bye.